right. <laughs> but it was interesting as we as I as I went through the scriptures, I read a lot of scriptures trying to let the Lord tell me where to go this week. And uh, it was interesting. And, and I and I have to share, I think the devil works through these computers, um, through <laughs> updates, because <clears throat> mine decided it had to last night. So I got half the sermon on one computer, switched to the other computer, but that one wouldn't connect to the internet. So between the two, I got it typed, and then I combined it all this morning. So maybe he didn't want me to finish it. But um, So here we are this week, um, but we won't get all the way through it. There's more here, so it'll have to go into next week. Our scripture starts in Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 to 35. It says, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. This is out of the NIV, but I'm reading. Then Jesus told them, this very night with, you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will scatter. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're all in a position where at some point where we have denied you as Peter did. But Father, we thank you this morning for your grace. Father, we're going to see that, Lord, as we get through this message and into the following, Lord, just what you do through that grace, Lord, what you were able to do for us, even when we are unworthy, Lord, even when we fail, because we will. But, Father, we thank you this morning that you are good, that you are gracious, Lord, that you are forgiving. Father, be with us today as we get into your word. Help me to speak clearly and boldly for you this morning, Father. Lord, be in each heart here as they listen, Lord. Help them to inscribe it on their very hearts, Lord. We thank you for this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, you got to enjoy a break from my voice. You got to learn, listen to Wayne. And, and I, too, had the chance to listen to it as, as they posted it online. And it was a good message. In fact, I'm, I'm kind of piggybacking a little bit off of where I left off and a little bit off of what he said last week. The fact that... Uh, we are in confusing times. And boy, was he right. We are in confusing times. Of course, people's opinions of the time we're in varies based on what they believe about eternity and about how we get there. So you see a lot of different things, and that's partially what makes it such a confusing time. Some would say, oh, it's a great time. It's a time when you can, you can be whoever you want to be. You can be whatever you want to be. Do whatever you feel like doing with no consequences. Because if you believe there's no absolute truth and no absolute moral compass, then whatever you decide in your mind to be true must be true. Right? That's where some are today. And that's, that's one, of the, one of the things you're going to run into today in these confusing times. Now, some of us would say that's ridiculous. Some would say that seems harsh to say it's ridiculous. But that's the only word I can think of to explain it. You see, because that's a slippery slope to get onto. Once you go down that path, that path of depravity, which, which the humanity can sink to, there's, there's no bottom to it. When left to wander in the darkness, only led by the wiles of the devil and his angels, this is, that's a very, very difficult situation that we can find ourselves in. And it's just one of the situations we can find ourselves in in these confusing times. Now, there is the complete opposite scenario here that you'll also find today. You will hear those who will tell you, well, we are in the end times and we need to steal ourselves away into the recesses of the Bible, immerse ourselves in prayer, and then we must continually keep ourselves in repentance for our sins, the sins of our nation, and all the while keeping ourselves in our close-knit little communities and, and, and hiding from everybody else and hiding from the rest of the world. That's another, that's kind of the other extreme. 
These individuals have gone into self-preservation mode and are simply waiting for the return of the Lord. Some even waiting in fear because they've even been mistaught about what is to happen when the Lord comes or before or after the Lord comes. So there's people living in constant fear. The Lord doesn't want us to live in fear of his return. We're supposed to be waiting expectantly for his return. So you see, it can go either way. And as Wayne said, we are in confusing times. When we're supposed to try to figure out where do we fit in the middle of that. What are we to do? How are we to know what to do? How are we to know how to react to what we see going on around us? How are we to keep living in a life of faith in a way that represents our belief in Christ and our devotion to Him? As well as our commitment to following the greatest commandment, to go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So how do we know what to do? Who can we look to in these confusing times? What, what part of the Bible can we turn to and find something that relates to where we find ourselves? Well, Peter is one I think represents where we're at pretty well. Where we currently find ourselves. And yet, he served the Lord faithfully and diligently till his death. But Peter also lived in confusing times, just as we live in confusing times. We read the first scripture this morning where the Lord had told Peter that he would deny him three times. Again, in Matthew 26, Jesus said, This very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. He was zealous. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Peter, one of the twelve. How could he deny the Lord three times? Why wasn't he bold enough to go and die right, assault, right alongside the Savior? Well, for one thing, we know now that that was not the Lord's plan for Peter. What was taking place in that moment, that moment in time, had been set forth from long ago. Before any of the twelve were around, before any of those in power that were, that were arresting Jesus, before any of them were around, it was written what was going to happen to the Son of Man. So this was something as much as he, in his, in his mind, in, in his boldness, he said, I'll go to death with him. That wasn't part of the plan. Couldn't happen. He was making a way for us a long time before it happened. A way for us to be welcomed in to eternal life. A way for us to be adopted into that family. Even with all of our imperfections. Even with the way we fail. Even because of our human condition. He still made a way for us to be spotless in the eyes of the Lord. It's not that Peter wasn't bold. Not that he wasn't zealous, because we know if you look through the scriptures, Peter was one of the boldest, sometimes to his detriment. But much like us, Peter was in those confusing times. In a day where there had always been a way you were expected to act, a certain way you were expected to worship God, a certain number of rituals and traditions and rules that you were to follow and worship. Up until that point, it was believed that, that only through good works and, and regular sacrifice could one make it to eternity. And then came Jesus. One who was claiming to be the Son of God, who said he was one with the Father, who said he could, he could forgive sins, who said through him was the only way to the Father and to eternity in heaven. Well, that was radical. That, that was absurd to some of them. They couldn't imagine that. But it was enticing. To those who believed it made sense. Jesus was performing miracles. He was healing the blind, the lame, the sick. He could cast out demons from those who were possessed and even the evil spirits. When he cast them out, said, what do you want with us, son of the most high God? Even they knew who he was. Jesus, this, this man in his 30s, younger than I am now, 
was changing the world. And even his disciples were doing great works by healing and casting out of evil spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. So people were confused. What's right, what's wrong, what's good, and what's bad? Who, who are we supposed to listen to here? It was a confusing time, like no other, maybe, probably more so than today, and Peter was caught up in the middle of that. Now, there's another factor that plays into the reason Peter ended up denying the Lord three times. Even after all he had seen and done, after all of this, all, he, he, this was the guy that walked on water. To meet Jesus. You gotta remember something. Peter was human. Just like you and I are human. Thankfully, we know today that the Lord loves us even though we are. I want to look at the three denials of Peter in Luke chapter 22, going to verse 54. It says, Peter disowns Jesus. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl came to him, saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. That's the first one. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Number two, Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, and this is happening pretty quickly. It's not like a few days in between. Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Number three, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. What was the cause? What made him so vehemently deny any association with Jesus? He didn't just, he just said, I don't know him. He didn't say, well, I knew him a little bit, or, you know, I've heard him study, like, flat out, I don't know him, I don't know what you're talking about. Fear. Fear of rejection. Fear of ostracizing. Fear of, of bodily harm. Most of all, fear of death. As much as he had seen, as much as he wanted to follow him, he got scared. When it came right down to it, when he saw they were dragging Jesus away, when he saw he was handed over and beaten. He got scared. But Peter and the others, they, Jesus had told them this is going to happen, but he also told them, I'm going to raise again in three days. I'm going to raise from the grave. But they couldn't, they couldn't grasp that. They were focused on the death. They were just focused on that part. And that they, they couldn't get past that, and they were scared. So in their minds, they focused on the coming death and not the promised resurrection. He was gripped with fear, and that fear was a contributing factor, which caused him to deny Christ three times. And after doing so, he's riddled with remorse and sorrow for his actions, because he realized the Lord was right. He remembered what had been said, that he had been born. Peter couldn't stop it from happening. Peter had failed in those confusing times. He turned his back on the Lord, not fully understanding at the time that, that all of this had to take place. The Father would not have allowed him to save Jesus. That wasn't part of his plan. Even if he had been bold enough to go with Jesus to, the, to death as he said he was, it couldn't have happened. This was written. This is the way it had to be. We too are going to fail at some point. This is a guarantee. There's none of us who are perfect, none of us who are above reproach, but many who are forgiven by grace. When do we fail? How, how will we fail in these confusing times? How is it that we in our human family deny Christ today? The obvious 
is when, when, we, hear, when we hear a jab, that, and, I, and I hear this all the time, and I'm as guilty as the next person. We hear a jab or an insult to Christians or maybe even directed towards ourselves. At one time, I was the person giving the jabs, and I can remember some of them pretty vividly. The Lord doesn't let me forget them. When we are called hypocrites, when someone says, how can you possibly believe that garbage or, or aren't you smarter than that? Or, or how can you be so small minded? Or, there's so many insults we hear. But how do we respond? Do we shrink away? I know there are many, there are many in the world who when confronted simply say, well, well I, I was just kind of going along with it. I don't know if it's all true. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that I, I don't know. Or parents, or people say, well, well, my parents go, so I have to go. They drag me there. Or, or well, this is something we've always done. In doing those things, we deny the Lord. The reason, the reason we give those, that, any of them are denying the Lord. For some reason, it's so hard for us to just say, that's what I believe. Jesus died for me. That's a good enough reason for me. For I have seen him work. There isn't any of us who haven't seen the Lord do things in our lives and in the lives of others. Much like Peter and the disciples had seen. We have for some reason, it's so hard to speak that. Why? Fear. Plain and simple fear. Or possibly even unbelief, or at the least a misunderstanding of who Jesus really is. Who it is that we casually claim to have faith in. The Lord has no interest in casual claims of faith. He wants surrender, he wants repentant hearts and a committed soul. And we, we fail often in our lack of obedience. To the... To, that call that he puts on our hearts. We pay no heed to the nudges of the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, we postpone the will of God in our lives. He has a will for us, for each of us. And we have a way of delaying that. He's going to make it happen. We have a way of delaying it. Many times because we have not completely surrendered to him, to his will. When we refuse to help the hungry, when we, refu we refuse to give guidance to the lost, compassion to the brokenhearted. And love those who know only the ways of the wicked world. Those who are trapped by the trickery of the serpent. We, in refusing to do these things, are denying the Lord and Savior. Even among our fellow believers. In the church around the world today, we tend to be like an asical in our obedience. Allowing disunity to creep in among us. Allowing gossip to take place. Allowing desires and distractions and worldly temptations to guide our priorities in this life. And allowing them to be placed above our love and obedience to Christ. But again, these are confusing times. We're bombarded with fake news, fake truths, false morals, and false religions. Even when we're trying to be our best, it's hard to know what to do, right? It's hard for me to know what to do. We can quickly and easily find ourselves grieved by our actions or lack of actions. Feeling that somehow we've let in down. Or that we're not good enough for that. Somehow we're not saved. All, feel, all feelings which, if we linger on them for just a moment, the devil will pounce on them. He'll pound them into your head. That's not a place we need to be. That's not a place Christ wants us to be. That's just him attacking us. Saying, yeah, you're not good enough. Yeah, you messed up. Yeah, you, you missed talking to that guy. Imagine what was going through Peter's head after he denied Christ three times and watched him drug off. And saw him crucified thinking, maybe I could have stopped that. Maybe I could have done so. Imagine the beating he was taking from the devil. Those feelings don't come from God. They were coming from the devil. Some of you know the feelings I'm talking about. I struggle with them. The feelings that Peter was like, like he had when he was overwhelmed. As he felt that piercing gaze of the Savior with the rooster crowing in the background. Those who feel they are doing their best. Who feel like at some point they, they, they fail greatly or let the Lord down. 
by ignoring what we know we are to do. By giving in to that temptation, that thorn in the flesh, as Paul called it. We're going to feel that way occasionally. Because we are going to slip up at times. Especially because of how awful and confusing times are right now. But there's hope. I tell you that because I want you to know there's hope. I want you to know that if you felt that way, we don't have to stay feeling that way. That's the problem. We get in that rut of, woe is me, I failed. That, that feeling of, oh, I'm a failure, oh, I'm no good. Jesus never said that. He never said it once to Peter. There is hope. I want to look ahead in the scriptures, ahead to when Jesus had risen from the dead, when, he, when we find him on the shoreline cooking fish for the disciples. Some of you know that just before what we're going to read was the miraculous catch of fish. The disciples had gone back to what they knew. In those confusing times, what do we do? Jesus is gone. Oh, no, we'll go back to fishing. That's what we do when we get into those ruts, when we get into those feelings, we go back to what we knew before. Back to what was comfortable, back to what dulled our senses, back to what made us feel good at the time. Because we don't know what to do. I failed, so it must be I'm no good. But that's not where Jesus wants us to be. And we're going to see that here. John chapter 21, starting at verse 15. <clears throat> It says, Jesus reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. And I don't think it was lost on Peter that it was the third time. Do you love me, he said. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. He said, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where, where you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. And someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would, in which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. And here's Peter thinking, thinking about worldly stuff again. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who, who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw this, when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to do? You must follow me. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Not by accident, as I said, three times, one for each denial of the Lord. And three times he gave him a command, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Then at the end he says, follow me. He even reiterates the need to focus on him. As Peter had looked back at John and said, Lord, what about him? What about that guy? What are you going to tell him? They all ran away too. Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? You must follow me. His job was not to worry about what the Lord had in store for the other, but rather to remain focused on him. To follow the Lord. Now we all, we all have failed. We have all fallen short. Myself, I'm sure, more than most. But in our grief and sorrow at failing, we miss what the Lord is saying to each of us. Just as he was saying to Peter. He doesn't want you to focus on what you did or didn't do. In these confusing times, he wants us to seek him. 
to be listening for him. He is speaking to each one of you. He is saying, do you love me? When we fail, he's asking, do you love me? Just like Peter, he knows your heart. He knew how Peter felt before he asked the question. He doesn't want you to focus on what you dare to do. He is speaking to you. Each time we stumble, each time his hand is extended to us, and he's whispering to us, saying, do you love me? If your answer is, as Peter's was, is yes. Then he also says to you, follow me. He's still there. He's still calling each one of you. He sees your repentant heart, and he did Peter's. He is still leading you in these confusing times. We, like Peter, have to decide who we're going to follow, what we're going to cave into, and when we mess up, we need to decide what we're going to do about it. Are we going to wallow around, or are we going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to get back up, and I'm going to keep trying. Who do we love? And who do we want to follow? And that's where I want to, I'm going to have to stop there for the week. Because next week I want to look more into the restoration of Peter. Because there's a missing part there. Remember, the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. Jesus had not ascended to heaven yet. There's, there's more to come. There's more for us. So that we can know we are not alone. We are never alone. Alone. So let's stop there for the week. And let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, that we are not alone. That Father, when we fail, Father, when we fall flat on our faces, we do. You're not scolding us. Father, you're not sending us off to a chamber, Lord. You're just reaching out your hand, Lord. You're saying, do you love me? Lord, you know we do. So, Father, we also know that in that, Lord, you are saying, follow me. Lord, help us in that. Help us to follow you. To listen for your voice, to drown out all the stuff out there, all the things in this world, the noise in this world that that wants to distract us, that wants to tell us what else we should believe, that wants to tell us what else we sh what we should or shouldn't do. Father, help us to look to your word, to listen to your spirit, to follow your leading, Lord. To simply follow you. Help us in this today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>